everyone. Uh, my name is Kirthi Vedantham. Uh, I'm a reporter at Crunchbase News, and I am moderating this panel, Building for the Future, Creating Better Cities, Streets, and Businesses. Um, I'm excited for this. I normally cover healthcare and biotech, but I think my expertise here is that I live in LA and I don't drive a car. Um, I'm going to have everyone kind of introduce yourself. Ben, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Benjamin Trum. I'm a product manager at Lyft, uh, and I lead the, the mapping team uh, at, at Lyft. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hillary Norton. I'm the executive director of FastLink DTLA, a transportation management organization for downtown Los Angeles that is committed to reducing single occupant driving by 75% by 2030. And I'm also one of the California Transportation Commissioners one of 13 members of a commission that manages five to eight billion dollars in gas tax funds every year for the state. Hi everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Prescott. Uh, I'm a VC, I invest in transportation and energy technologies and a big focus over the last few years for us has been about how those technologies actually get used in cities. Hi, I'm Eddie Navarrete. I am the executive director of the Independent Hospitality Coalition, representing small business hospitality uses in Los Angeles. My background is architecture, land use, and kitchen design. And I came up to represent the hospitality community, knowing the in and outs, the bottlenecks of what holds back a lot of entrepreneurs from progressing forward. And so that's what the Independent Hospitality Coalition is about. It's about progressing our independence here in Los Angeles and building our small business community. button helps turning it on uh my name is justin robinson uh leading strategy and partnerships for a company called pipe dream where we are putting pipes underground and running autonomous robots through those pipes to deliver to deliver packages food groceries directly from retail into homes apartments um offices etc previously started a company called drizzly which was beer wine and spirit delivery and spent a lot of time clogging up the curb, and so want to try to solve some of that uh, at Pipe Dream. Okay, great. Um, so I kind of think, obviously, everyone here knows that mo better cities are inherently related to mobility, transportation, curb space. Um, I kind of want to ask you guys what you guys think are the missed opportunities right now in terms of how we're utilizing our physical space um, and in what ways they should change. And Hillary, I kind of want to start with you on that since your background, you know, you know a lot about the transport, what LA's tra transportation situation looks like. Yeah, well, first of all, I think that one of the best missed opportunities right now is that the people who are coming downtown want to do more than work. And I really think we need to make it much more possible for you to go to work and then go to lunch and go to dinner and make it part of a really great, vibrant entertainment city. And I think that if we can start really thinking about how we're gonna move our transportation network around people doing more than one thing when they come downtown, when they come back to cities, we'll do so much better. And I think especially that's important for women, making sure that we can travel safely after dark to all the things that we wanna do. I mean, small business is the backbone of our communities. And really, we have to look at what they have been doing for years and what we can allow them to do. And we've had this three-year pilot program called Alfresco, which has shown what we can do, what shows what they can do if we just get out of the way. And so I feel like missed opportunities are allowing more businesses, giving more businesses those opportunities so that they can thrive and make our streets safer. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what's the phrase, like, you never waste a good crisis or whatever, like, the, you know, last three years have been, have scrambled all of our brains, I think, in terms of, like, <laughs> how we how we live in cities and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, if we're going to sort of start to, re, like, rebuild or refigure or, like, think about this again, like, we should do it better, you know, and so we were just talking before, for instance, about just, like, much better uh, understanding of, like, where the best place to get picked up and drop off uh, is, like, what the best... Uh, you know, in different contexts, when it's raining, when it's night, when it's winter, when it's summer, that side of thing. Um, or like I live in San Francisco and uh, one of the, I think the best parts about the last couple of years is like building these sort of parklets that people eat outside. It's a community space. People are, you know, 
uh, hanging out. It's like a fun to be a pedestrian. And now they're like tearing half of them down to turn them back into parking spots. You know, this, and this for me is like, we, we're wasting the crisis to some extent because we're like sort of uh, deconstructing some of this like cool, I think like, you know, human infrastructure that we made, which actually made it fun to be outside. So, um, you know, I think that there's, there's some really cool opportunities that are emerging, but we also just need to like look at the things that happened and see the things that were, uh, you know, actually uh, uh, pretty neat and pretty cool and that we should keep. I'm a big investor in, uh, in India. And more so, I think, than in the United States, people in India understand that cities are about opportunity. People come to cities because if you leave a village where you have two job opportunities, you go to a city, you have 2,000 job opportunities. The problem we have with mobility in cities today is when you're stuck in gridlock, your opportunities begin to close. When you can't have your kids safely walk to school and you have to actually drive your kid to school as a mom or a dad, that changes what your morning looks like. When you can't go home after work and feel safe, you have to leave early, that changes what your opportunity looks like. So it's almost impossible to say what the missed opportunities are because there are so many millions of missed opportunities every day. The most important question is how do you get mobility working so that people can go where they want to go and do whatever they want to do? I, I do think um, it, it does feel like there's a bit of like a domino effect almost, but it's impossible to say which domino is the first domino to fall. Um, and, you know, Justin, you uh, used to work at Drizzly. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about what was your experience working at the company? What, what did you learn about, I guess, the curb real estate while you were working uh, at that company and the friction points that exist there? Yeah. Um, so while at Drizzly, we you know, learned that a lot of the time spent picking up packages and dropping off packages results in double parking and congestion and traffic and is not sort of the optimal experience for any resident living in a city that you have to see all these Amazon trucks, Drizzly, Uber, whatever, double parked. It takes five minutes to pick up a package or food from inside a restaurant, bring it out. And that is inherently unsafe and it doesn't lead to like an optimal, you know, sort of pedestrian resident experience. Um, and so in, in Pipe Dream, what we're trying to solve is to essentially remove uh, commerce from the streets and from the curb and reduce all emissions and congestion along the way to make the curb what it should be, which is a gathering place and a delightful place for people to live and walk and talk and, and work. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what we're up to. Yeah, I, mean, I think one of the things that I realized is like, it's, it's not inherently very flexible the way we think about like the, the curve, like everything is like very, like we try to like very neatly designate it for these very specific It's explicitly not and, flexible. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, and literally it's like, permanent. It, it needs to be and it, it should be like, I have this all the time where I get like, very frustrated when people double park in front of my my house uh, when they're delivering things, and yet I fully expect people to deliver things to me, and I, I like cannot connect these two these two issues, uh, and you know just that realization alone, you know, like this is happening in cities, and it's we've we've changed none of the infrastructure to actually account for it. Um, so you know this is a you know maybe it's a little bit what I was saying before. It, it feels like uh, you know we should. Uh, this is a great opportunity again to like reevaluate what we're doing some of this and have spaces that we've like set aside that aren't like fire hydrants, uh, you know, to ensure that there's like a, a flexible space where people can come and go, can do that kind of drop off and things like that. So I feel like Pipe Dream Labs is like kind of a really, it's a really fascinating and interesting way to alleviate some of the burden off the curb and to make it a, a space where people can sort of build community. Um, and I, I feel like, Eddie, you and I are both people who take the bus. We both took the bus to curb before today. Um, you, I think, know a lot about sort of, and you live in LA, uh, you're from here, you're born and raised here. Um, the communal aspect of sort of, or, or the role transportation plays in community activity or communal activity, I think is really interesting when we think about what like a better city looks like and the roles, the role of cars essentially. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on all that. 
Yeah, so I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and, you know, being in L.A., it's obviously a very diverse place to live, uh, a lot of different types of communities out there. And I feel like, you know, when you're able to interact with people from different communities and being forced to be with them outside of being in your car, you really get to remove some of those barriers that you feel that you may need to have. And when we think about infrastructure in our communities, we really have to think about how we want to see people wanting to live together and join together and exist together. And by doing that, we have to think about getting people out of their cars. You know, living in those bubbles um, does not allow for people to really grow together and to innovate together and to just coexist and, and not have those maybe, you know, whatever barriers that they may be living in a different community. Um, I just think that just there's so much more to offer when you're able to walk from some, one block to the other. I live in um, the Arts District, kind of little Tokyo area here in downtown. I took the dash here, but I take the dash everywhere. It's just such a great opportunity. I love not being able to get in my car. I love being able to walk to the market. Um, it's, you know, it's very kind of like ethnic forward type market, but I just get so much out of it, being able to go to the local dry cleaner and walk to uh, my local sushi place or, you know, my, my local bar if I have to, or I take the, the bus to my girlfriend's house in Silver Lake. It's just, it's so easy. And I get to know LA so much more when I'm able to just get to take the streets and see the streets and be on the streets, you just get to really um, feel like you're part of the community as opposed to just driving from one place to the other every day. I, I, I mean, obviously I don't drive, so I have to agree. I feel like I'm not siloed by the highways. I, I'm in the neighborhoods. I see how the different neighborhoods connect as a virtu by virtue of being someone who's a pedestrian and a busser in these streets. Hillary? Yeah, I, I want to say that that's one of the reasons why I'm a huge proponent of the LA streetcar that we have planned here because we have a gorgeous city when we you can actually look up and look around and see what's there and actually interact with people. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous city that usually has fantastic weather and we don't get to see enough of it because we're so, if you're driving, you just are looking at all the ways that you could possibly get lost, all the interactions. You don't get to appreciate the city. And I think that's really what people like. And I also say as a soccer fan and, and a season ticket holder for the Angel City Football Club, there's nothing more fun than being on the trains all in your uniforms. And we are a sports town. Every day is game day. We should be really building that exciting rapport. And um, the same is true of the Music Center and the Hollywood Bowl. Everyone that I know that has taken the bus to the Hollywood Bowl never goes back. And, and having Lyft and, and Lyft at the Hollywood Bowl, but Lyft also at the, um, the Coliseum and the, the Bank of America uh, California Stadium, it is so much better when you can share the experience and you don't have to think, oh my gosh, where's my car? Where did I park? How do I get there? How much is it costing? You just think about how much fun you're having. And, and I think that ability to meet new people and talk and not think, oh my gosh, how am I going to, especially for us women, how am I going to walk to my car in a dark parking lot? Am I going to be safe? Is it okay? Taking that away and just enjoying and being in the moment is so different. And so I just think the more we can do that, the more we can actually enjoy our city, the more we're going to be spending time in that city. I think that we're saying the easy things right now, which is we all want a walkable city. We all want to be able to just go see our neighbors, walk to wherever we want to go. Um, there's a next part of that conversation, though, which is the harder part, maybe not in this audience, but it's redevelopment. Why do people walk? Because we live in a city, especially in Los Angeles, that's particularly hard to walk and bike in. And as much as we can, you know, hope that the you know, millennial and, and uh, Gen Z trends to not want to drive is going to be durable. The moment that we all start having kids as millennials and Gen Z, it's going to hit a wall. And the wall is not because people want to drive. The wall is because we've built a city that can't be safely and pleasantly biked and walked through. Obviously, there are a lot of amazing parts of Los Angeles. The point is, we have to really reconsider how are we going to generate density, 
change zoning laws, and get transport re get transit refunded. Uh, ironically, and someone mentioned it earlier that European cities, if you go to Europe recently, like they're all outside, they're walking around, they're sitting outside of the coffee shop, having a conversation like that type of vibe, I think is one that a lot of us would like to live in. Those are the old cities mm -hmm. in the U S like cities were built for cars. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's almost like we need to go back and redevelop a world that is older. If this is the type of environment we want and in, you know, is not built for cars essentially because the European cities largely aren't right. And it's just an interesting like way to think about how cities have been created in the United States. You know, a lot of the work that we do at IHC is advocacy based. And so we've been looking at a lot of the policies that, you know, um, limit us from being able to grow what we do and, and bringing building on community. And I feel like there's this I don't want to just sound too, too cliche, but I will anyways about the old guard kind of being in place in some of these departments. But I really feel that we have to look at how important the private sector can be in the involvement and working together with these departments to coexist together as well. Uh, oftentimes policies are written and you know, nobody, there's no public outreach. We don't really know about some of these things. Sometimes only one department has a public outreach process, but not our building departments, not about fire departments, not about the health department. What about the other departments that can help us get there? I feel like, how do we do that? I feel like we need to really have a lot more of these opportunities to grow together and, and really look at what we want to be building for our city to get there. I would, I would love to hear your thoughts on this, Hillary. What does a public-private partnership, first of all, just within cities or counties, there are so many municipalities involved in like one bus stop or like one space, and then you're adding private partnerships on top of it. I, that's a whole separate thing to me. Like it, that involves like APIs. Are the, are, is the private sector even working within the private sector with each other? You know, and then a private-public partnership is just the amalgamation of all these things that need to work together and it, it seems it sounds nice it always sounds nice um but like how how would it actually work i think that's fascinating and one of the things that i i need to plug governor newsom for is that last year the state allocated an additional one billion dollars for walking and biking money active transportation money the money is there the demand is there we really can design new streets and then apply for money to do just that. I will say in your point about the layers of approvals and what it means for public-private partnerships, we really do need to revamp how we think about the public realm. Because you've got the LAPD, you've got Bureau of Street Lighting, you've got LADOT, you have all these different layers instead of saying, this is what we want it to look like. How do we get that? We need to start doing much more of that. And that's being built into the downtown community plan. But even that right now may not happen if you don't approve it. The EIR could, the environmental impact report could expire in May if we're not paying attention. We need to think about supporting these plans and the way the public-private partnerships exist as an existential opportunity to do it better, but it also is an existential threat if it can't happen and we have to go back to the drawing board. So you're absolutely right that we have to get the public and private right and the incentives right. Prescott, uh, again, in terms of the private side of public-private partnerships, um, you do work with a lot of companies in this kind of urbanism space. I'm curious, like, when you look at these companies, do you ever think about how are they supposed to work with each other? How is this curb meter supposed to work with this transportation thing supposed to work with this charging thing or anything like that? Do you, in my opinion, sometimes I feel like companies tend to not want to have these open APIs and, and to work with each other. And I, I want to hear from your perspective. Yeah, the, the tech world tends to think about compatibility and alignment in terms of protocols and standards and communications. That doesn't matter as much as the most important standard, which is a shared vision. And what I mean by that is when Lime and Spin and Scoot and all the scooter companies are at war over the sidewalk and cities are canceling them and they're pushing back and getting, you have to realize they're fighting over a tiny segment of space 
because cars have taken everything else. And people are allowed to park cars for 48 hours without having to move them for free on the street. And everyone else is fighting among, you know, for breadcrumbs. So further to your point, there is the need for political leadership to take, sure, there's all these fighting, not fighting, collaborating factions of different departments and funding organizations and execution organizations and private groups that, that can support transit and transit-oriented development. You could spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to get them coordinated, but you also need somebody at the top that's pushing a, a unified vision that citizens can get excited about. You know, when you look at um, the shutdown of Times Square to cars, this is a, you know, a, a very common example people give. So excuse me if it's boring to a lot of you all, but you know, Bloomberg and, and Sadiq Khan will say, it was extremely unpopular. People were saying, oh my gosh, you're gonna close Times Square? That's where I get, you know, through Midtown Manhattan, et cetera, to up, up to, to where I you know, live in the Bronx. How am I gonna do that? One year after it was done, enormously popular move. Same with the slow streets. COVID gave us the political cover to make changes that require behavioral changes which nobody wants to make because we're all busy and we can't think about another way of living life and then we look at what happened and we're like, oh my gosh, this is so much better. What were we doing before? But you can't have that happen until you have political leadership that can paint a vision that's attractive to people. So yeah, standards matter, protocols matter, communications matter, but you, you have to have a vision. Otherwise, you're not going in the same direction. So I... Um... Actually, I, just, I just wanted to chime in. I mean, I, I don't disagree with any of that. I mean, I, uh, but I mean, I will say that uh, the... You know, even just like speaking from a technology standpoint as someone trying to like build a, a map of these cities that help people navigate it, like like we are, it's it's actually quite challenging to do. Like we were talking about curves before, like like the fact of the matter is most map making these days occurs through imagery. You basically like, you, you get images or you use like sort of the, the telemetry of like cars are moving or how people are moving. Like that's how you basically build up these maps. The fact of the matter is, like, the, the curves are, like, they're so obscure. Like, they're occluded by cars parked. Like, but, like, it's very actually hard to derive a lot of the data that's most useful for a pedestrian or somebody who's trying to find the right pickup spot or even just, like, trying to, like, come up with, uh, you know, this sort of, like, uh, preferred multimodal trip. Like, you know, drive to this place, take a bike. Like, the, the amount of data that you, from diverse sources that you need to stitch together to actually make that kind of recommendation. Um, there, like, there is not a particularly good, like, there are pockets of, of it, but there's not a particularly good sort of partnership between, I think, the public and the private sector and just making this sort of data, which everybody would benefit from, like, freely available. For the most part, like, we're trying to, like, figure out ways to, to look at the this tiny little section of the road to see what color the curb has been, uh, you know, painted in order to actually, like, put that into a map, which helps us understand, like, the best place to get picked up and dropped off. So it's like... You know, even things like that, we are like, it's almost like we're working cross purposes or, the, or I don't even know if that's the case. They're just these sort of legacy ways that we signal these things uh, that, that are just, just make it sort of inefficient from a technology perspective. And we can't go, we, we have to re recalibrate our culture, not around what's prohibited, but what's welcomed. And to really think about how do we welcome the right things? How do we start thinking about where people work, where people want to go? and welcome people there and build around that instead of thinking, what's the red curb, what's the blue curb? Because that assignment of space is more about prohibition than attraction, and we have to build around attraction. We have 50 million tourists that want to come downtown, that want to come to this city every year, but it's got to make sense. And the more we welcome them and make it easy and make it possible and make it make sense, the more they're gonna tell their friends and more people will come and we will have additional money to build the, the other parts of the ecosystem so people don't have to have their car at all. So um, Prescott mentioned that we've built this city, Justin, you mentioned we've kind of built cities in a way that we've built them for cars. Like from the get-go, these cities were built for cars. Um, and changing that kind of behavioral pattern can be really difficult. And Ben, I'm curious at Lyft if you guys think about this. Like when I think about coming downtown, I think, thank God I don't have to take my car down here or a car down here because it's so hard to find parking. Like that seems to take up a lot of time and brain space. Do 
you guys notice, you know, with customers at Lyft, like how they think about transit and how they think about, you know, taking a lift or the time and energy worth taking a lift versus the time and energy of taking a car? Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, like the sort of singular obsession of the people who founded Lyft was, you know, basically turning cities into places that weren't built around cars, but were built around people. Like that is a phrase that, you know, you, you basically can't go a day at Lyft without hearing that phrase. Uh, and, it, you know, it's the one that in, inspires me as well. I think, you know, in, in practice, this is this is quite challenging. I mean, Lyft has, uh, you know, the one of the, the things that, you know, we, we've invested a huge amount of time in is the, the our bikes and scooters program. So the, all the bike share uh, offerings that we have. And, you know, actually, frankly, one of the, the things that we've, we've found is there's not nearly as much overlap as you'd imagine between people that, uh, you know, use bikes and scooters and, and use rideshare. And, you know, ideally, you know, like in an ideal world, people would, would view, uh, you know, these things as like part of their own, trans like a, a multimodal transportation network where you could like drive to some place that then facilitates taking a bike to get into a more congested area, things like that. Um, and in general, I, people, I, you know, there are, there are definitely indicators that some people are this, but for the most part, people are not sort of multimodal travelers inherently. They sort of pick one and they sort of stick to it in, in, a, in a way. And that, like, I think, think we see that pattern reflected. Now, there are pockets where that's not true. For instance, in, in New York City, uh, especially during the pandemic, there was this enormous explosion of people that used, you know, bike share and things like that. Uh, and and, and that, that was one of the, the, the coolest things to watch happen. Um, but there, you know, there's like a, I think there's a, a fair amount of work that uh, we need to do sort of collectively uh, to get people to, to start to think about you know transit in a multimodal way uh, and, and to like stitch these options together. Like uh, you were talking about like going to to like uh, you know uh, sports games and things like that. Like you know it, it is a it's an utter nightmare to drive to uh, you know a lot of these um, uh, uh, various arenas and, and whatnot in San Francisco, but. It's actually really, really pleasant. I, I've got it down now where I know I can drive to a place a couple miles away. I can, it's easy for me to park. There's like a Lyft bike share dock right there. I hop on the bike and I'm there in no time. And I get to like, you know, ride the bike through like the, the fans. It's, it's nice. I mean, it's just like, it, that's, it's a very pleasant experience. And I think part of like Lyft's challenge is to, is to make that clear to a user who's like opening the app and, and trying to make a decision about how to get there. Uh, that's something that I think that, you know, we, we have all the assets in place and, uh, and we want to keep working on that. Um, you know, but this is, again, it's not like a, no, no one entity is going to solve this problem. Is that a look into the Lyft product roadmap, though? Because as a New York City resident, I would love to know the quickest way is to take a bike share here, subway. Like you know, a Google Maps, like the bus tri bus option. For and right now, it's just like one or the other. Uh, I, uh, feedback received. Uh, something we think about a lot, uh, for sure. Um, I also do feel like sometimes in cities, the behavior to take a car can be rewarded in a sense. Prescott, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. I, someone told me in the crowd that um, like 14% of LA County is devoted to parking. I don't know how true that is, but it, you know, I, I, there's definitely uh, a lot of the city that's devoted just to parking. Yeah, I mean, people talk about the car subsidy and what they mean by that. And a lot of drivers will say, well, I'm driving because it's the most convenient. What other option do I have? That is the car subsidy. It's the fact that, well, you can drive and get parking, but you can't bike safely. And when you bike there, you lock your bike, someone's going to steal it because there's not street enforcement. And a culture of respecting people's bikes the same way you respect people's cars. It's not an explicit dollar subsidy, but if you were to try to put a dollar on it, you'd want to start with the land dedicated to parking. Uh, you'd want to start with the fact that street parking is very affordable. And it makes sense because, you know... I'm going to go out on a limb here and kind of like make a comparison to the student loan forgiveness program. But the student loan forgiveness program made a lot of sense for a big segment of society. It's not all of society. It's, a, it's the upper middle class that really benefited from the, the loan subsidies. In the same way, cars are a really great, great way of getting around for a big segment of society. The issue is if you fall below the threshold, meaning if you can't afford a car, you're screwed. All the, the resources that we as a society are setting up to help people stay in a system that works for them only works if you can minimally get into that I own a car bucket. Obviously, you can make it work in the same way that you don't have to go to college and you can make it work. You know, I, I left college early. But it's, it's the idea that as a society, we are prescribing a way of living to people that we don't need to prescribe. Um, so that's, that's what I would suggest is the car subsidy.
Hillary, um, on the public sector, have you guys talked about the car subsidy and, and sort of what to do about that? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it all the time. And in fact, what we find is people are moving into cities, what they would much rather pay for, instead of paying $500 a month to park, they'd rather put that money into an extra bedroom in an apartment. I mean, if you can put that money towards living space and really like your life, it's so different. But that means that we have to have really nimble and affordable transit opportunities. And one of the things that CTC can fund are express lanes and congestion pricing lanes. And talk about things that are controversial. You know, I was part of the first express lanes that are on the 110 and the 10 freeway. And at first people were like, that's terrible. And people will never change. But now we have the best bus system, the Silver Line. I think people take it all the time. And it's gonna go fully electric. And it's encouraged people to carpool and to do things differently. We, we are going to need to meet lots of the use cases. And so how we get there without having to take your own car is top of mind all the time. And so to whatever extent we can get a lift as a partner, to whatever extent transit becomes a partner, but we have to also realize that transit is expensive to operate and we do not have dedicated sources of revenue to operate transit. And that fiscal cliff is something we think about all the time. And so it's one of the things that we're working on all the time with congestion pricing and where we need private sector partners to fill in the gaps that are just way too expensive for public transportation to fill. You, you fill in a very, very important niche, but let's figure out how to do it nimbly um, and uh, maybe think about where those spaces need to be on the curb especially with all these one-way streets, I think people think, I'm gonna get lift right now from where I'm standing and don't think, you may be standing in a place that has just added 20 minutes for someone to get to you or to get to where you wanna go and you don't have any idea. We need to think about more, is this the best place for me to be if I wanna go someplace and how can we guide people to like a better route? Uh, so I think that, We've got to invest more in public transportation, but also invest more in thinking, maybe I need to be not expecting everything to just come to me in the way I want it, in the way I've been served, and got used to it as a car driver, and need to think about how my behavior needs to contribute to a system that works better, and an ecosystem that is much more affordable and manageable, and then fills in with all the altos and the lifts and everything else. If I could, I could add to that, you know, the public transportation rider myself and, you know, here riding our metro system, even our red line, our purple line that we have here, um, it's really dangerous. And I feel for the folks that have no other alternative but to take those lines, um, the danger that they put themselves in and, and what that is doing to our younger communities as well and what they're seeing every day. And it's just really going against us getting to those places. And I feel, yes, like you said, let's invest more into public transportation. Let's invest into our streets. But we really have to consider, and it goes to the leadership thing as well, that we have to install safety mechanisms in these places. So it's just a safer journey. How are we going to get our tourists that come here that want to take public transportation to want to just to encourage them to do this as well? How do we do it? We got to build it, but it's got to have safety measures in place. And right now, it's really a, a breeding ground for criminal activity, and we we need to change that. And I know that you know a lot has happened since COVID, but I think we have opportunities to make a difference. And safety, I think, is something that we need to put in a huge perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, like I mean, it's, it's like a couple times safety's come up. I mean, the safety has like all kinds of manifestations, but like uh, even just like one thing that. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about is just like, uh, there's basic stuff that you can do to improve pedestrian safety. I mean, I, I was uh, I was recently pointed to this article about, uh, uh, I think it's Hoboken, uh, where they um, uh, they had like a, a spike in, in pedestrian deaths and they found out that like, all, like if, if all you do is just remove a parking spot on either side of a crosswalk, I think that's called daylight, right. basically create daylight, you dramatically reduce the number of pedestrians. Like again, this shares like parking you know, coming back to like 
uh, you know, literally kill people in this case because like a person stepping out from a, you know, into a crosswalk from between two cars, like they're occluded by oncoming and people can't see them. And if, then if you remove it, suddenly you can see people, uh, you know, so like this is even the type of thing that from a mapping perspective, you know, like we can begin to figure out like, oh, the, here's the case. You've actually created a dangerous traffic situation. Maybe we need to say a lot to a driver, but the ultimate way to solve it is just to not have the dangerous, you know, situation at all. So there, there's like basic, ba these, are, these don't seem like, you know, particularly challenging ideas. They're just, it's just challenging from like a, uh, you know, like a motivation standpoint, I think. I, I remember reading that as well. And it's one of the, it's a good example of like these invisible friction points that we don't even know are friction points, but they exist. Um, Justin, in, in terms of infrastructure, I think Hype Dream Labs is really interesting in that like you build these underground tunnels and they deliver goods. Do you have like any projects underway that you're allowed to talk about right now? Because I, I, I'm having trouble like visualizing it. Yeah, we have one project underway that is going to launch next month, so I can't get into too much detail. And then a couple more uh, in master plan communities. So communities that are being built from the ground up, reimagining what a city should look and feel like where they're not built around cars. In fact, they don't want cars in their community and they're being built on just dirt, right? And, and they're saying, how do we build a sustainable, friendly, walkable community? And the answer is without cars and without deliveries needing to be run to every single household from an Amazon truck, but can we bring it to one distribution center and have all deliveries go out to every single home? That's to give you a sense of where we're headed with some folks, that's where. But that's what happens when you rethink how you would build a city. And I think it's how some of these cities are being built these days are going to come back and help inform how we should retrofit existing American cities, um, you know, through the next decades, which will be exciting. So. All right, so we have five minutes left. Um, I do kind of want to say that everyone's approaching this transportation problem through a very different lens on this panel, which I think is great. But what's interesting to me is that everyone agrees. All of you seem to agree. Um, and yet I personally don't see a lot of changes, you know, happening like on the road itself. Um, I, I'm curious to know like what, like what's the next step here? Like what's supposed to happen at this point? There's, people are spending millions of dollars in venture money, private money, public money, trying to get people to change their behaviors. Behaviors have not changed. Um, and people don't want to let go of their cars. They don't want to let go of their cars in order to build these great, nice things we keep promising. But because we don't have great, nice things, uh, they want to keep their cars. What, how, what, where, what do we, where do we go from here? Yeah, everything in transportation is a network and it, it's subject to network effects. Your point about the safety, Great issue. If there's nobody riding transit, it becomes a ghost town. Ghost towns get filled with ghosts, right? I mean, for your networks, if you were to put out the capex required to run these pipes, but nobody's getting on the network, it would fall apart. You you need a critical mass, and the issue what we have today is that transit and shared services, despite the funding that has gone into trying to get them going, include and I include private funding for things like ride hail they have entered or they are at risk of entering a bit of a death spiral. So we need to have a surge of investment and a coordinated effort to change consumer behavior. Now you can change consumer behavior through religion, you could change consumer behavior through evangelism, but actually the best way to change consumer behavior is pricing signals. And that's why the stuff that you're working on, Hillary, for congestion pricing, and changing pricing signals for telling people, hey, you have to pay for parking because it actually costs something like from, from a societal perspective, that's the most important next step to start getting systemic change that will bias in favor of shared services, which are what you need to enable all the things we're talking about. And I think those pricing signals have to think about equity. Who, who do we want to make sure isn't left behind? And how do we look at women and, and the the tax we pay after dark because we can't take everything and walk on the streets the same way. We end up having to pay more to park closer to the street light or to have um, different services because we want to be safe. Or you have a lot of women who just aren't making the trip at all. And I think that is the worst thing at all is that 
there are a lot of women who are feeling that they are not having that same economic equity because they don't feel safe to participate in the system in the same ways that others. We have to make it possible for low-income people to be on the system and be protected at all times. We have to make sure that people who are in wheelchairs and are traveling differently have a safe sidewalk. It, it, it matters. This is crucial. So we need to think about pricing and incentives and safety and opportunity. But when we get it right, <coughs> excuse me, but when we get it right, we're going to be the city to watch. And I think that's the, the thing we need to go for is that people want to visit cities that make sense. And you see it in New York. You see it all over the place. Let's make our city a city that makes sense and point to where people should go to experience it differently. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, if you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to approach them. Uh, but thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you for great moderating. Yeah, great job.